particles, the number of components. And then he assigned to the framed link the sum over all states S of this variable A raised to the number of positive smoothings minus the negative smoothings, negative A squared minus A to the negative two times the number of components. And that's the Kaufman bracket. And of course it satisfies um, two scheme relations that actually define it. And one of them is that, and what you're supposed to imagine is outside this ball everything is identical. And in the ball, the two annuli are running the same side up. Mm. You have this skein relation. And, and whenever you see a component that's just a plain old circle, it becomes negative a squared minus a to the negative two. So it wasn't long after that, really not long at all, since after I heard that, that I heard the word skein. And that's because I had this job as a lecturer at UC Santa Barbara and, and Ray Licorice was there and he used the word skein to refer to diagrams inside a region in the plane and as a way to get at the multilinearity of the definition of not polynomials. And then that got turned into skein module. And the first time I heard skein module was was from Pshatitsky in 1992. And uh, then I guess Turayev also uh, came up with the notion of a skein module. <clears throat> M needs to be an oriented three manifold. And the reason why you need an orientation is so you can tell the difference between this positive smoothing and the negative smoothing. And now L, is this set of isotopy classes of framed links. And that's up to, and, and now what you do is you form a vector space whose basis is given by uh, those isotopy classes of framed links. And the way I'm gonna do it here today, I'm only gonna work with the variable as a complex number. A is now gonna be a complex number and you mod out by the submodule of all skein relations, which you know, consists of uh, triples of diagrams that are identical outside. Oh, I, I did it backwards. Wow. And, and of course, if you have a component that's zero framed and disjoint from the less rest of the diagram, then you can replace it by negative a squared minus a to the negative two. And that's the Kaufman bracket skein module of, of M at the variable A. And now if you were attempting- the inverse in there somewhere? Oh, yes, it is. Thank you, Dale. Got it? All right. And now if you wanted to talk about the Kaufman bracket of, of a framed link in a three manifold, well, it turns out that this, this vector space here, it's not one dimensional. And so you have to have some scheme for choosing a linear functional. So to have a Kaufman bracket, you need a scheme for defining a linear functional. Uh, L from Ka of M to the complex numbers. And now you take your equivalence class of framed link, you apply the linear functional L to it, and now you have a complex number. And this was first, you know, conjectured by Witten, but it was actually through Blanchet, Habiger, Masbaum, and Vogel that uh, they constructed uh, this for three manifolds at a four rth <clears throat> root of unity. And the idea was 
that they could figure out how to use Dane surgery to find an isomorphism from one of these spaces to another after they modded out by the radical of a pairing that came from the Kaufman bracket. And then of course, Ray in his book did a really nice job of explaining this. And actually my favorite was Justin Roberts approach. And so now the variable zeta is going to be a four r root of unity. And what Justin did, so that's the variable zeta, that's the three manifold, is he just modded out by anything that contained the r minus first jones wenzel idempotent, And that, that was isomorphic to the complex numbers. And I should remind you that the jones wenzel idempotents are based on the Chebyshev polynomials of the second kind that I'm, uh, I'm writing down the formula for these. And, and then the rth one, that means skeins that have been colored with this guy. You mod them out and you just get a comp copy of the complex numbers. And there it is, there's your Kaufman bracket. Um, there's another family <clears throat> of, of Chebyshev polynomials, and this is really strange. Okay, these are the, see, these are the Chebyshev polynomials of the second kind. And, and you can tell that because it starts with one. And these are the Chebyshev polynomials of the first kind. And, they start with a two, but then they have the same iterative scheme, okay? And it turns out that these are actually better Chebyshev polynomials than those. And the relationship is the nth Chebyshev polynomial of the uh, first kind uh, is equal to the difference of the nth Chebyshev polynomial of the second kind minus the n minus second Chebyshev polynomial of the second kind. But I'll come back to those later and explain to you why they're so important. But in the meantime, when is Ka of m an algebra under disjoint union. So right now, what I've got is a vector space. When, when can I multiply? And obviously the way to multiply is you take two framed links, perturb them so they're disjoint from one another, and then just take their union. And that should be the product. Well, when A equals plus or minus one, uh, so here we go, that's negative, minus that, and now I'll change the crossing, and now that's negative this minus that, they're equal. So in fact, when the variable in the Kaufman bracket is plus or minus one, you can't see crossing changes. So this is equal to that, and that tells you that K A of M is an algebra. And in fact, it's a commutative algebra because disjoint union can't see the difference. So Charlie? Yes. Uh, when A is minus one, I agree with that. But when A is plus one, it looks like you would get plus signs. Not that it really makes a big deal. Well, there are, yeah, with plus signs, I wrote plus signs and then, they're good? Yeah, maybe, maybe you could just put plus or minus there. You're right. Got it, I'm all over it. Yeah, thanks. All right. So, but what's funny now when a is equal to plus or minus i, now what happens is this, and I'm just going to do a equals plus i, Scott, because I don't want, because I'll just get confused if I put plus or minuses. So then this is i times this minus i times that, and this is i times that plus, whoa, 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 i times that, 
minus i times this. So what happens <clears throat> at i is you change sign. That's the negative. You, every time you change a crossing, you change sign. But this is the amazing thing. Ka of m can be written as a direct sum over x in the first homology of m with z2 coefficients of these sub vector spaces. And basically kxa is the part of the scheme module that is spanned by all framed links that represent that first homology class with z2 coefficients. And the skein relations, everything that appears in the skein relation is homologous to one another. And so the skein relations preserve this grading. Okay. And so the skein module is actually the skein module, the Kaufman bracket skein module is graded by the first homology of the manifold with Z2 coefficients. There's a, a more modern, there's a GL2 skein module which maps down to the Kaufman bracket skein module. And this is due to Paul Wedrich and O.L. Kwefalik. And it's graded by the first homology of M with Z coefficients, and which is really actually even better. But, but here's what I wanna say, K zero of plus or minus I is a commutative algebra. And now the reason is, okay, you change a crossing, you change sign, well, Z2 linking number behaves the same way. And so what you do to multiply L and L prime, where they both represent zero, which means they have a linking number, what it is is negative one to the linking number of L and L prime mod two, and then take their disjoint union. And now, no matter how you perturb it, of course it changes sign, but so does the linking number, and now it's a commutative algebra. So that's, so at plus or minus i, and this was explored by Julien Marche, and he has a really, for in the case of M being a cylinder over a surface, um, then the skein module is actually an algebra. The full skein module is an algebra under stacking. And he analyzes the structure of this algebra and, and comes up with a geometric explanation. And that's in uh, Mathematische Annalen, Julien Marche. So now we have these algebras. What are they? And so about the, the same time that uh, the skein modules and skein algebras were invented, uh, Claudio Procesi had solved the, uh, the first and second uh, fundamental theorems of classical invariant theory. And it turned out that his solution looked like skein relations. Okay, and so to explain this, I'm going to present to you a, a portrait of the Cayley Hamilton identity as a skein relation. And this is this theorem of Prochesi's is why all of this works. So I'm going to start off with a two by two matrix of determinant one. Now it's characteristic polynomial is the determinant of the matrix where I subtract lambda from the- What, are the, in, in, what are the entries, uh, Charlie? Any, anything that I can multiply together so that AD minus okay. BD equals one. Right, fair enough. So, 
field. They're from a field. Okay. And now this determ this characteristic polynomial is lambda squared minus a plus d lambda, and then a d minus b c. That's one is one. That's the characteristic polynomial. But I can be more fancy and write that as lambda squared minus the trace of a times lambda plus one. Now, the Cayley-Hamilton identity says that if I interpret this as a matrix equation, then the matrix A solves it. So in fact, instead of writing zero, I write the two by two matrix of all zeros. Instead of lambda, I put A squared. And then I put this scalar, the trace of A times A plus, and now this is the identity matrix. The next time I write the identity matrix, I'll just write id. Well, I want to symmetrize this. So I multiply through by the inverse of A. And by the way, the inverse of A, D, A, negative B, negative C, you exchange the diagonal entries and take the negatives of the off diagonal entries. The, the trace of A inverse is equal to the trace of A. Uh, so anyways, here I go. I'm multiplying through by A inverse, A, minus trace A, and as promised, I write the identity plus A inverse. Now, I'm gonna multiply this by one more matrix, and I'm gonna multiply by another matrix B. And so now the zero matrix times any matrix is zero. I get AB minus the trace of A times B plus A inverse B adds up to zero. And finally, to get back in the world of functions, I take the trace and using the linearity of the trace, I get that the trace of A times the trace of B is equal to the trace of AB plus the trace of A inverse B. Okay. Now let's talk about a once punctured torus and it, it's fundamental group is the free group on two generators. And I'm gonna draw a once punctured torus. And now if you're drawing a loop on this, you can figure out the conjugacy class of the loop by if I go through this band here, that's the, the letter A, this band here, that direction, that's the letter B. And I'm going to assume that A and B are Basically, I want to look at a representation of the fundamental group of the once punctured torus into SL2C. And that just corresponds to choosing two two by two matrices of determinant one. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a portrait of that Cayley Hamilton identity. And whenever people do this fancy stuff, it all boils down to just drawing a picture of the Cayley-Hamilton identity. So here I go, I'm gonna draw a picture of the trace of A. So I close that loop up. There's a loop, it's closed. That means you contract, you get the trace of A. And then this is, I'm drawing into the same diagram, trace of B. And so this is the product, trace of A times the trace of B, okay. So now I wanna do the trace of A times B. So first I go through A and then I turn and I go through B and that's that picture. And that's the trace of AB. And now finally, I wanna draw a picture of the trace of A inverse B. Okay. so. Since it's A inverse, I have to go around A backwards, and then I go around here forwards, and then I close it up. And there it is, the Cayley-Hamilton identity, trace of A inverse B. But, and you see, I don't have to have orientations on them for the following reason, because the trace of A, the trace of any matrix is equal to the trace of its inverse. And so there's no need for an orientation. There's no need for a base point because trace doesn't see conjugacy. But now here's, look at, the diagrams are identical outside of this disk. 
It's a skein relation. And specifically, it's the flattened out skein relation. Uh, like that. <laughs> so the, now to get everything to work right, instead of using trace, you use negative the trace. And then Prochese's theorem uh, said that the invariance for, and now he did it for GLN, GLNR, are generated by traces of words of length at most n plus one and functional and then all relations and this is the second theorem all the relations come from functional evaluation of the fully polarized Cayley Hamilton identity. And what that means is you take the, the, the characteristic polynomial and you turn it into a multilinear form. And that's what it means to polarize it. And now you just plug words into that and all the relations between invariant functions come from that. And of course, that's what we've written down in this case. And this was a theorem of my student, Doug Bullock, that if you take K negative one, of M and you kill off the radical, then that's isomorphic to the ring of SL2C characters functions that are invariant under conjugation of the fundamental group of M. Now, at the same time, Mike Hilden and Greg Broomfield they just did this whole thing because they learned about Prochese's theorem. They did the whole thing for, uh, for a finitely generated group. And then they also knew this work of Lubotsky and, and Andy Magid about uh, unreduced, the coordinate rings of unreduced character varieties. And what they did was they did a similar proof where they just took the group ring of a finitely generated group modded out by uh, basically relations coming from Cayley Hamilton. And they got the unreduced coordinate ring, coordinate ring of the SL2C character variety of G. So it would have no potence. And then this is about a year later. This is Pshatitsky and Shikora. What they did was they proved K negative one of M is isomorphic to the Broomfield Hilden construction. By the way, in addition to Broomfield and Hilden, uh, a Japanese mathematician named Sato also did the same constructions. And so this is the, the history of how this, is, this happened. And then it was an English physicist named John Barrett who showed that K zeta of M is always isomorphic to K negative zeta of M with the choice of a spin structure. So if you actually have a spin structure on a three manifold, there's no difference between Ka and K negative A, which then completes it because now with the choice of spin structure, K one of M is isomorphic to K negative one of M, which is isomorphic to the characters. More recently, and this is uh, me and Joanna Kanya Bartoszynska. And Tang Lei. We proved that K zero plus or minus I 
of M is isomorphic to the unreduced coordinate ring of PSL2C characters that lift to SL2C characters. So once and so at fourth roots of unity, it has to do with PSL2C. At second roots of unity, it has to do with SL2C. Okay, so that brings me uh, to modern times. And the next big theorem, zeta is now going to be an nth root of unity. Now, is it okay? Am I going too fast? Am I making sense? Am I racing? Good it's okay. Me. Everything's Speak. fine for me. Yeah, Alice in Ordnance. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, zeta is an n root, nth root of unity. And now what you do is you let m be that order divided by its greatest common divisor with four. And now when you take zeta to the m squared, you're going to get plus or minus one or plus or minus i. And basically when n is not divisible by four, you get plus or minus one. And when n is divisible by four, you get plus or minus i. And now this is a theorem of Helen Wong Francis Bonahan and Tang Lei. And what it says is there's a threading map from, oh, this number, that's gonna be epsilon. There's a threading map from K epsilon of M into K zeta of M. And the, the first round of this, comes from Helen and Francis, but this has been explored further by Hugh Morton and Peter Samuelson in the cases of the Homfley polynomial and the Kaufman polynomial. There are versions of this due to them. And, um, and what you do is you, you thread your framed link, you use the annulus as a guide and you plug in a copy of TM multilinearly into each framed link. And now if N is not divisible by four, if I have some component of a link threaded by TM, then it's transparent. I can change, I can change crossings. And if N is divisible by four, changing a crossing changes the sign. So there's this alternating thing that comes from I. And, uh, and this is a, a theorem of, you know, Froman, Kanya Bartoshinska and Lay, then K zeta of M is a finite rank module over k epsilon of m when n is not divisible by four and k zeta naught of m is a finite rank module over k epsilon zero of m when n is divisible by four. And you know, Fancy language, the Kaufman brackets gain module of a three manifold is the global sections of a sheaf defined over the unreduced affine scheme 
of the character variety. And now what that means is that young hotshot people with jobs at fancy schools force themselves on me and tell me things that I don't understand. A can, word you, can, of. can you restate the fancy language? The Kaufman, bracket, the, the Kaufman brackets gain module of a three manifold is the global sections of a sheaf over the character variety of the fundamental group of the three manifold. Can you? And then, but now, but now, when I say character variety, I mean the unreduced fine scheme. Is there any restriction on the manifold? I mean, uh, uh, have I missed something? Uh, it should be uh, compact and oriented. Compact and oriented. Okay. Yeah. Compact and oriented. And uh, this is, and then there, you know, then there's just this huge explosion. There are these people in Edinburgh, uh, David Jordan, and then he has uh, collaborators, um, Ganev and Safranov, who then came up with a Czech definition of skein modules, like Czech homology where they basically, you have a tangle functor in a ball and that defines a functor from the category of balls to the category of vector spaces. And now you map balls into manifolds and that gives a functor there. And then they're using the Kahn extension theorem to construct an object associated, it's a graded object uh, associated to any three manifold and the zeroth part of that graded object is the Kaufman brackets game module. And in fact, then they can do it for any, uh, you know, semi-simple algebraic group. And then they have versions of all the theorems that we've proved uh, for any semi-simple algebraic group. And they know what the skein module is and what skein algebras are. And they understand the representation theory of those algebras. And uh, more or less, basically everything I'm gonna tell you is true, okay? Only it's true in much greater generality and it's just not a skein module anymore. It's a graded object like homology theory and it's called factorization homology. And uh, then, David has a graduate student, Juliet Cook. And I guess she's giving a talk in some virtual meeting in Hamburg, maybe this week about this stuff. Okay. So this allowed us to actually identify the center of, so give, now I'm gonna talk about the scheme module of a surface, which is an algebra under stacking. And now the surface has to be finite type, which means that it's a closed surface, closed oriented surface minus finitely many points. So there's my closed oriented surface. And now I'm removing finitely many points. And then there's a little skein that comes from surrounding each puncture. And those skeins are central. And now uh, when N is not divisible by four, the center of the Kaufman bracket skein algebra is the image of the threading map with, then you adjoin the little skeins that surround the punctures. And when N is divisible by four, the center of the skein algebra is the threading map applied to K zero epsilon of F and it's joining all these. Now, you know, once you know the center of an algebra, you, you essentially know its representation theory. And so, Having identified the center, then we could 
then analyze the representation theory. And the, the problem, what's the zero mean? Represents, uh, it, it means represents zero in the first homology of the surface with Z2 coefficients. Good? Did, did I answer your question? Okay, good. So uh, maybe I, there's something else I wanna tell you and that is that there are no zero divisors. And this is actually a theorem of Shatitsky and Shikora from last year, 2019 in the transactions, which then means that the center is the coordinate ring because it's finally generated of, uh, you know, an algebraic variety. And we call that the variety of shadows. And it's a finite sheeted branched cover of the, you know, corresponding character variety. And to be simple, when F is closed, it is the character variety. So the center of the Kaufman bracket skein algebra is exactly the coordinate ring of the SL2C character variety when N isn't divisible by four. And it's the coordinate ring of the PSL2C character variety when, it, when N is divisible by four. And so what you should think of is the Kaufman bracket skein algebra is then a collection of operators on holomorphic sections of a line bundle over the character variety. That's actually what it is. And that actually identifies it. So one more thing, we, we defined a trace and the trace It, we, we also compute the trace. So it's an algebra over the, over the center. We localize the center to make it a field. And now an element of the algebra acts by left multiplication on the algebra to find the matrix, take the trace of the matrix. And that's the trace. And um, this trace turns K theta of F into what is known as a Cayley Hamilton algebra. And Cayley Hamilton algebras were studied by Rosso, DeConcini, uh, Procesi, and Reshetikin. Okay. So, first thing, what do I mean by a representation? What I mean by a representation is a homomorphism from K zeta of F into, you know, N by N matrices for some N. It's a different N than the root of unity. Maybe, maybe what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make that a D. That's a representation. And now a representation is irreducible if it's onto. And there are lots of definitions of irreducible representation. You know, algebraists have, you know, 60 different words for irreducible, but really it boils down to that's an onto mapping. And since you know the center of a matrix algebra is just the diagonal matrices, what it means is that row of the center of F can be, is actually complex multiples of the identity. And so, so then you put row to the center and get 
a homomorphism to the complex numbers. And it's defined as follows that um, if I apply the representation row to an element of the center, then it's this central character applied to Z times the identity map. And when you learn a bunch about representation theory of algebras, you know that the whole goal is always to classify the representations by the central character. And generically, generically, this is true. That, that two representations are equivalent as representations if and only if they have the same central character. But there's a trick to get it to be true all the time, which is why I mentioned all these fancy guys' names up here. And now a representation is trace preserving if, uh, if I take the trace in matrices of row of an element of the algebra, I get the same answer as if I took the central character and applied it to the trace of alpha inside the algebra, where this trace on the right-hand side is that trace that I talked about coming from left multiplication, and the trace over on the left-hand side, that's just the trace of matrices. And now, uh, you need the trace preserving representations to be in the matrices that have the same dimension of the algebra. And so we calculated the dimension of the algebra and that's the dimension we're gonna work with. So D squared is the dimension of, of um, K zeta of F over the center. And now, uh, the variety, and it is a variety of trace preserving representations um, has as GIT quotient, you know, geometric invariant theory quotient, the variety of the center of the algebra. That's the fancy theorem. So in fact, there is one trace preserving semi-simple you know, equivalence class of semi-simple trace preserving representations of the skein algebra for every uh, conjugacy class of SL2C representations of, of the fundamental group of the surface into SL2C. So in fact, you go through this whole, you know, hajira of studying the representation theory of the Kaufman bracket skein algebra, and you find out that it's the same as the representation theory of the fundamental group of the surface. It's completely determined by the representation theory of the fundamental group of the surface into SL2C. That's all there ever was. Isn't that amazing? So, but now, if H is a handle body and rho from pi one of H into SL2C is irreducible, then corresponding to rho, rho you know, is is the trace of rho and actually negative trace of rho, which, de which uh, defines a homomorphism from, and I'm just gonna stick to K negative one of H right now to the complex numbers. And that has a kernel, M is the kernel of the corresponding homomorphism negative trace of rho from the skein module. And what I can do is I can take K zeta of M, mod, I can thread M mod out by tau of M, K zeta of M, and I get a finite dimensional vector space. And 
it's and whoa, 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 that's H, H. I, yeah, I was about to say. That's H. K zeta of the boundary of H acts on K zeta of H. K zeta of H is a left module over the scale algebra of its boundary. And the way that works is you just plug a collar of the boundary into the handle body. And now you reduce this by that quotient, which I'm going to call this k zeta rho of h. And now this is what happens. Whoa, this is what happens. I don't know how any of the equipment works. Oh my gosh, what do I do now? Okay, back to normal. This guy is an irreducible representation of the skein algebra of the boundary. And the thing I should have said about irreducible representations is irreducible representations are trace preserving because there's a unique trace on a matrix algebra. So that means that this variety, inside this variety of representations of the skein algebra lie the representations coming from the skein algebra acting on handle bodies that it bounds. And so now if M is a three manifold, it has, you can write it as a Haggard splitting, H union B, where the intersection of H and B is the boundary of H, which is the boundary of B, which I'll call F. And then this is a theorem of, well, it's in a joint paper with Razvan Jelka, but in fact, Razvan proved this, that you can understand um, the Kaufman bracket skein module of three manifold as the tensor product of the skein modules of the two handle bodies over the skein algebra of the Haggard surface. And now when you reduce at uh, an irreducible representation, you're taking the tensor product basically of the, because a matrix algebra, you understand only has one irreducible representation. And now if it's a left module, it's the column vectors. If it's a right module, it's the row vectors. And so reducing this formula on the right-hand side, I'm taking the tensor product of the row vectors with the column vectors over the matrices. And that's the complex numbers. And that's what happens. And then with Razvan, in simple examples for lens spaces, we produce all of the dual space of LPQ with uh, these linear functionals. So in fact, in small examples, the dual space of the Kaufman bracket skein module is spanned by linear functionals that come from irreducible representations of its fundamental group into SL2C. And of course, the way you can arrive at one of those is to put a hyperbolic structure on your manifold. And I, Okay, that is the story. So you said uh, you put a hyperbolic structure in your three manifold, but you're talking about lens spaces. Well, so these cases, that's where we can work the examples and they're not even irreducible representations and they still produce copies of C this way. Uh huh. And so it, it even works when they're not, you know, I know it all works when they're irreducible. It turns out it works out when they're reducible too. Oh, I think that was Brian. It's okay. I'll, uh, I'll have to. It's all right. I probably lost everybody. <laughs> 
well, I mean, what do I say? I mean, you know, you, you dig away as a mathematician and suddenly you fall through a hole into a treasure trove. It was fun. Uh, yeah. The whole, the whole gig was fun. Okay, from, from deciding I was going to do it back in 1978 to now. I had a lot of fun. And, you know, I'm not sure it. Well, there's no point in doing maths unless it's fun. Right. Anyway, thank you very much, Charlie. Nice talk. Thanks. Thank you. Can I ask a question? You can. Uh, you may. Uh, to, to what extent is the uh, Kaufman bracket skein module of a three manifold dependent on the fundamental group? I, I believe it's completely dependent on the fundamental group. Okay. I think it's, but, but then it's, it has more data built into it, you know, because you're keeping track of, I, it's fundamental group plus a little bit. Well, that's a, what's that's the little a little bit? Model, which is, you know, the <coughs> group plus extras. Right. It, it's, it's also keeping track of representations of the fundamental group into SL2C. That's the extra. Right. And so, in fact, the, the other information in the Kaufman bracket skein module, you can pick off the information by choosing a representation of the fundamental group of the three manifold in <laughs> SL2C and using that to cut down the skein module to produce a linear functional that measures it. And I think that's everything. Think so does it then contain peripheral information for the fundamental group? It, it, it can, you know, you have to set it up. So you're keeping track of the per peripheral algebra, right? Yeah. And, and you know, piecemeal, um, almost all the theory just points to the Kaufman bracket scheme module measures representations of the fundamental group in SL2C in the end. It's extraordinary, isn't it, how powerful SL2C is? It is. <laughs> And you can multiply them in your head. Yeah, they're only little titchy two by twos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any more questions? Great talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, uh, beautiful. Other groups in SL2, well, that's what uh, David Jordan, who's a professor in Edinburgh, and, and his collaborators have done is they've taken this whole mechanism and all the things we've done and they've effortlessly carried it over to all semi-simple algebraic groups. So you could talk about SL3, you could talk about, and of course, you know, with combinatorial representation theorists, you know, like, uh, you know, the, you know, the people who follow Fock and Goncharov and uh, they have this whole, you know, world of trying to build the correspondence between the combinatorics of these diagrams and surfaces and the geometric structure of character varieties of, of surface groups. And the big conjecture is like, like so in the case of, of uh, SL2C, the simple closed curves, the, the simple diagrams on the surface turn out to be the corners of the character variety if you define it in a natural way so that you have you can talk about convex convexity the corners of the character variety come from those and then recently the same theorem was proved about the non-elliptic trivalent webs in a surface up to isotopy that they correspond to the corners of the sl3 character variety and so there's a, a lot of work of people just trying to take these these combinatorial objects we study and then see them in the geometry of character varieties. That's way over my head. <laughs> I don't think so. Any more questions? 
Okay. Um, I don't know if, if you have any announcements, Lou, but um, next week is, uh, is Victoria Levin, who's going to talk an hour earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, but I'll send around a note about that. And then the week got, after coming, it, it's blue. I'm going to um, do something to do or cloud. I can't do it. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Uh, then, okay, so Victoria Levitt next week, an hour earlier. And then the week after that, it's uh, Rob um, from Berkeley. And... Um, and then we're going to have a break. Rob Kirby. After Rob Kirby, it's a Christmas break, and then we'll start again in January. But I'll send around notes about that. Okay. And if anybody has a talk inside them and wants to talk, let me know. Um, otherwise, you'll have to put up with me and Lou. But uh... <laughs> right. Any more, any more, any more to say, any more? Okay, I will end things now. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.